Hey, everybody, welcome to Red May, your one month vacation from capitalism. 43 events, over 110 speakers, as Al Pacino would say, wow. Uh, before we get into uh, There Is No Unhappy Revolution, one of the great titles of the millennium, I'd like to clue you in as to what's coming up uh, in Red May for the next uh, five or six days. We are on the home stretch here. It's our last week of events. Uh, so uh, at 5 p.m. today, Mark's Asia History with uh, Rebecca Carl, Gavin Walker, Ken Kawashima, and Asad Hader. Tomorrow at 11 a.m., Critical Theory in the 21st Century with uh, Chris O'Kane and Werner Bonefeld, two of the editors of the Sage Companion to the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, the Sage Handbook to Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, one of the great uh, resources for studying critical theory. Uh, Christian Lotz and Amy Diaz will be on that. Hope I'm pronouncing Amy's name right. <clears throat> At 5 p.m. on Thursday tomorrow, counterinsurgency policing with Omedi Ochieng, Paul Passavant, Stuart Schrader, Travis Harris, Paige May, Samantha Pre Gonzalez, and Charmaine Schwaz, the moderator. On Friday at 11 a.m., Debt After Graber. Uh, that has Max Haven, Cassie Thornton, Radhika Desai, Lee Claire Laberge, and Andrew Ross. And at 3 p.m., What Just Happened? A review of the events over the last year. Uh, with Joshua Clover, Jody Deem, Thea Ria Francos, Idris Robinson, Nikhil Pal Singh. Uh, on Saturday at 10 a.m., neither settler nor native, with Mahmoud Mandani, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Samara Esmir, and Ted Swedenberg. That'll be a discussion of settler colonialism, as you might imagine. And uh, at 11 a.m. on Sunday, rethinking the Chinese. Cultural Revolution, Alessandro Russo, Andrea Piazzarolo, Longobardi, Chris Connery, Asad Hader. That's at 11 a.m. And at 5 p.m. Sunday evening, Feminist International, How to Change Everything with Veronica Gago, Michael Hart, and Kathy Weeks. So a lot of great stuff coming up. How do we, how do we put it on? We must have uh, ladles of institutional funding, you, you, you think. You would think of looking at the names and the reach of this festival, but then ask yourself, how much institutional funding can a Kami festival get in the United States? The answer is, of course, zero. We depend on the kindness of strangers like Blanche Dubois. We depend on you. Reach in your pockets. Bring out your credit cards and go to www.redmayseattle.org and you will find a button saying donate you can either give to our GoFundMe, which is Fan the Flames of Red May, or our Patreon. You can be a patron of Red May. So you could say, my lord, I'm a patron or something like that. Anyway, $3 a month, $5 a month, $10 and $20 a month. Uh, choose your weapon, give however you like, but please give. We enjoy doing this crazy excessive festival. We're all mad men and we wanna do it again. Uh, but enough talk about money. Let's get down to why we're here. There is no unhappy revolution to uh, lead us through this seductive and enigmatic phrase. I will turn it over to Bella Bravo, who's a writer living in Madison, Wisconsin, and they have participated in a few communist reading groups over the years. Bella, to you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm super excited uh, to. Uh, help facilitate uh, this discussion today. We're going to hear from uh, Gerardo Munoz, um, Andres Guzman, Idris Robinson, and Richard Broad. Uh, so to start the conversation, uh, Gerardo uh, has agreed to go first. Um, he's a prolific writer and an interlocutor. Um, over the past several years, his dialogue um, with various collaborators, including uh, Ricardo Carmi in Chile and more recently, in more recently Idris Robinson, um, have 
con they've contributed to contemporary thought on destitution um, and the notion of infrapolitics, uh, which I think will come up um, quite a bit today. And uh, Andres Guzman, he's the author of uh, Universal Citizenship, uh, Latinx Studies and the Limits of Identity. Um, this is a book about the figure of the citizen, um, the 2006 marches of undocumented immigrants, BLM and revolution. Uh, he teaches uh, Latinx literature and cultural studies at Indiana University. Uh, Idris Robinson is the author of several essays on civil war <laughs> uh, and its American lineage specifically and the George Floyd uprising. His first essay in this series, How It Might Should Be Done, began with a talk uh, at Red May, Seattle. So that's wonderful to bring it home. Uh, that was on July 20th, 2020. So still in the midst of the uprising. Um, and Idris is a philosopher um, at the University of New Mexico. And I believe he'll, he and uh, Gerardo will uh, talk a little bit about a recent uh, conversation that they had uh, called the revolt eclipses, whatever the world, um, whatever the world has to. So Richard Broad is the translator uh, of There Is No uh, Unhappy Revolution. So thank you <laughs> for that wonderful pot slatch, just putting that all in our laps. Um, and which is the topic of discussion today. He also recently translated The Golden Horde, uh, Revolutionary Italy, 1960 to 1977 um, by Nani Balestrini and Primo uh, Moroni. It's their account of the Italian revolutionary movements in the 1960s and 70s woven together with writings from other radicals, philosophers and participants in struggle at the time. Um, so we're going to start with, uh, Gerardo, thank you so much. Um, well, thank you all of you and Bella for the generous introduction and of course to, to Red May for the work you're doing. And uh, I also wanna thank of course, um, Idris Robinson, Huge Pharrell and, and Marcello Tari too, with, with whom uh, some of us uh, have been having conversations and exchange for, for quite a bit now. And it's definitely a pleasure that, that this book is finally published in English uh, by, by an excellent translation of, uh, of Richard Broad. And um, I, I wanna limit myself to, to the time that I have, not to, not to say too much, uh, because I have written a little text here that, that might be too, too long even for for the for the for the time that I have um, that I have right now in the conversation, um, but 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 I do want to say maybe maybe three things uh, in order in order to move and push the discussion forward, and and then later on if there's something that is not clear and and that maybe um, I can explain and develop a little bit more, well that would be I think ideal for me. And also for me to be able to, to think with all of you, which I think is the necessary condition of having spaces like this in the time where the university is, of course, um, um, uh, limited to a certain reproduction, right? And, and complete valorization of, of languages, you know? Um, uh, that, that, in a way, the book also tries to uh, get away from, why right? to move away from Marcello's book, I mean. So I'll get into that. Uh, I, I think. Um, the first thing that I would say is that I think that Marcello's book is, is important, not only because it revives the discussion of, um, of communism, uh, right, but rather because it, 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 it develops that discussion and, and it puts it uh, in relation between um, uh, the historical present and the apparaia or the interregnum between thinking and action, you know. I, I, I am old enough to remember, you know, as some, as some people say, that about a decade ago, well, the discussion regarding communism and something that Marcello takes distance immediately away from was uh, about the idea of communism, right? And, and in Latin American studies, where I come from, uh, this, this position became basically a philological position, you know? It became a position to, uh, a position of restitution. It became a, a sort of a sociological and historicist sort of uh, maneuver to rescue, well, all forgotten archives, you know? 
uh, bring historical figures to the present. I think that uh, the beauty and the importance of Marcello's book is precisely to, to, to avoid you know, this trap. Um, not, again, I don't mean to say that we shouldn't study the tradition and the archive of the left or Marxism, that's not the point. But the point is that there also has to be a, uh, a debate, a serious debate about the, um, the, the, the productivity and the efficacy of uh, a certain tradition of the left that was, well, you know, ruined by what Carlo Galli and other thinkers have, other thinkers have been calling, you know, the, the end of the modern architectonics of the political, right? The crisis of legitimation and a certain exhaustion uh, of the very economy, right? In Rainer Schulman um, vocabulary between thinking and, and action. So I, I think that, that uh, this is the, fir the first point that I wanna make, that I think that Marcello's book is precisely a way to, uh, the happiness is already a happiness of thought, I think, you know? And when he mentions, for instance, musicality or rhythm, uh, I think that one should take that very seriously um, as, as, uh, as a way to dwell in, in a moment in which the, the vocabulary, right? The, the modern vocabulary of politics is defunct and everything has to be reinvented anew, you know? Um, the, the, second, the second problem that I wanted to, to uh, bring up has to do with, I think, is, is the kernel, you know, the, the vortex of, um, of Marcello's book, which I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, comes up or is thematized as what he calls revolutionary becoming, you know? So I think that Marcello, in, the, in this constellation that I'm sure we're going to discuss, under the sign or the, the, the proto-category of destitution, uh, Marcello is, is um, uh, fundamentally and, and with force pushing for what he calls a uh, revolutionary uh, becoming. Um, understanding the institution not just as, a, uh, as an intellectual or as a conceptual sort of notion, but rather as something that can reactivate right, precisely the uh, modern notion of revolution that was in a way pertained to the philosophy of history and to the, uh, the tonality of, ha of unhappiness that was proper to a certain trap of the modern subjectivity, right? Of the modern subject. Um, so I think this is a crucial problem because precisely I think even in the, in the first pages of the book when, when Marcello talks about the revolution in the Copernican sense, I think that's a, an interesting and important way of thinking about it, right? I think the modern notions of revolutions in relation to the techno-political structure of the subject, of the party, of the vanguard, of the teacher that knows, of the pedagogue, uh, of the po of political economy, all of that has to be left behind. But what remains is precisely the movement of revolution as trying to find an eccentric point, right? Which was the, um, at least in, in this uh, great German philosopher that I, that I like, you know, Hans Blumenberg, um, in the notion of Copernicus as, as a revolutionary is precisely to try to find a, a sort of destitute the point of destitution, a point of exteriority, right, of the outside that can tip and transform the totality of the of the conditions of the present. And so uh, the way that Marcello, I think, is mobilizing um, this notion of revolution, I think is very important. It's a novel contribution to uh, leave behind, right, or at least for now, uh, categories that are, um, well, again, trapped in a, in a grammar of, uh, of modernist design. And, and of course, uh, let me just cite here, I think that um, uh, for Marcello, the, the revolutionary becoming is, uh, is a condition of, of communism, again, not as an idea or as a science or logic of, of history, uh, right? But, um, or not as an idea of the world, but he says as an unraveling of a praxis within the world. Um, and, this, and this communism requires a breakthrough, right? I think in both temporal and in spatial determinations, right, in order to prepare a, a dwelling, you know, a dwelling in in uh, in the world, a dwelling in in this in relation to this outside or the or what he also calls uh, immanence. And I think that uh, this this sort of revolutionary becoming uh, is, as he says in page sixty seven, right, is necessarily needs to be necessarily thought outside the subject, right? And he even calls the um, the, uh, the, the, the non-objective conditions of, of revolution have to go through a non-subjectivity of the political. 
which is something very interesting that I find there uh, is not cited, but um, the Spanish, the Spanish American philosopher Alberto Moreira has been uh, for a long time um, thematizing this idea of the of the non subject of the political. Um, mm, in relation, for instance, to the debate between hegemony and, and subalternity, right? That um, was a preoccupation, was a, an important debate back in the 90s and in post-colonial studies, right? And that in a way it speaks to the present as well because when Marcello criticizes the reformist politics uh, uh, on the left today, and I think that's what we have, right? The pragmatic left, it, it's a left that is completely on board uh, with the theory of hegemony. And I think that today, for instance, right? The institution is precisely one of the one of the proto notions, I would also say, for instance, that um, some of us have been talking about post hegemony or Afro pessimism, is uh, is a complete uh, a rupture or critique of the theory of hegemony, which has brought well a lot of deficiencies and I think impasses in the last decade in Latin America, right? In the in the so called um, cycle of Latin American progressive governments, for instance, right? Also most recently, as we were talking with Idris uh, recently, uh, in Spain, for instance, right? The crisis of Podemos, which is now a party that is a zombie party, it's still there, but it has lost completely any sort of attractiveness that it had at the beginning, right? Of the of the social or mobilizations of, uh, of the um, indignados back in 2011. Um, so I, I will. I know I don't have enough time. I'm gonna finish just with these two points. I think that so the the, the important thing to um, uh, I think in the, in Marcello's book to establish and to to put forth a a revol revolutionary destitution outside the subject um, that has to do with an intensification, with a play between event and form, which is something else that we can talk about. Um, has to do with identifying where, where is domination today, right? I think that's a, that's a central issue. Sometimes it's very, um, it's very obvious, but I think most of the times um, in, in conversations is, uh, is not, it's not a common ground, right? So of course, uh, I think here the question of the metropolis in relation with cybernetics is an important uh, dimension to consider, right? Because if we say that power is no, long, no, no longer in the sovereign, or it's not, even, it's not even anymore a mediation or dialectic between state and market or between globalization and nation, right? It's not even a question of, um, of models of economic dependency, right? Then what is at stake is understanding how effective the question of technicity orders the world in a certain sense. And here, I think the question of the metropolis is very interesting in order also to uh, revise and think through uh, the the power and the, um, the the level of intensification of the recent revolts. I think that the revolts of the Gile Gialli, uh, this the cycle of revolts in the United States or even in Chile, have a dimension that is completely expressed as a as a dimension that is anti-metropolitan against the metropolis, right? And it's not any more structured around any sort of um, ideological or um, subjective position, right? But it's more uh, a, a, a force unleashed um, for the lack uh, of experience in the, against the metropolis, which is an objectification of the world. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's an important point of, that the book thematizes um, quite clearly and, and quite beautifully um, in order to, to see in which way, right? We can develop mechanisms of, uh, of destituting, right? Or at least understanding ways of escaping uh, power, which as we know, you know, um, uh, strategies related to, for instance, culture, intersectionality, um, uh, hopes in, in civil society, right? Uh, inversions between society, uh, society and state relations no longer hold here if we assume that the condition of domination today is uh, cybernetics. Even I would say that experience is also under threat or has to be thought very carefully because second degree cybernetics, right, today also dominates the medium, that is, dominates the autopoietic and recursive mechanisms of the production of appearing in the world, right? And so the famous crisis of appearance that Cesarano developed back in the 1970s today has been completely thematized in very, in very novel ways by, by cybernetics, you know? And I think this is, this is a problem um, 
here we I would reference right. We had a conversation recently with Rodrigo Carmi about the re this relation of cybernetics and the university, because of course, right, the the pandemic will intensify. I think the the cyber the cybernetic dominion, you know. And and finally, I will finish with this. Um, I think I am on the limit with time, but um, I I don't know this. I don't know if I have enough time to to make this point clear, but uh, I guess I will leave it with a question or. Um, try to make it as, as clear as possible, or as simple as possible, I'm sorry, uh, which, which has to do with a certain ambivalence or valence in Marcello's um, treatment of destitution and even revolutionary becoming in relation to politics. At some points, and again, I don't, I don't have time to cite all the moments, but at some point, Marcello tells us, you know, in, in, the, um, in, in the vein of, in the Invisible Committee, right? Uh, in the vein of also Afro-pessimism, and I would also say in the vein of infrapolitics, that what we need to do is get something outside of politics, right? The politics is the enemy, right? And that something other than politics is necessary, right? But at the same time, at the end of the book, it seems to me that the centrality of, of, um, of a certain paradigm of conflict, um, let's say the insurrection, right? Tends to be the sort of phantasmatic guiding principle, right? That is always political, right? That understands, as Marcello says uh, at some point, that understands uh, love and intensification as necessary political. And he, here, I was, again, in, in the little text that I wrote, I tried to make the case a little bit more clear, but in order to push this a little bit further, I would perhaps ask to what extent this, is, this sort of centrality of the political is not still embedded in a certain principle of anarchy in the Rainer Schurman sense. But having a, a principle of anarchy is in itself paradoxical or at least con a contradiction, no? Because there is still, uh, I, I think, a sort of position that is reactive, right? To, uh, to, to the epoch of anarchy in which the, uh, the political drift has primacy over the anarchy of events uh, of the epoch. And so um, I would say that perhaps uh, opening up the institution towards a distance, right, uh, from politics, which is what some of us have, try, uh, try, have tried to think in recent years that we have called infrapolitics, it has nothing to do, although we, we admire his work, of course, but it has nothing to do with the famous James C. Scott's definition of infrapolitics, right, as uh, persistent from below. No, it, it's from politics as a way of, the, of dividing, of keeping a division between uh, or separation between existence and, and, pol and politics. No? And when, when Fred Moulton, for instance, says we have to defend the surround, uh, when Heidegger says that the essence of the police is not necessarily political, uh, I think that more or less that's an infrapolitical uh, kaisura there that I think it's important to uh, uh, at least have in mind today as politics, right, as, as factical politics today, have become completely um, fallen, right, have become completely thrown uh, into uh, biopolitics and technopolitical administration. So more, 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 than, more than ever, I think that the institution needs to have a certain distance from, uh, from politics, um, even if it is a politics of, um, of counter uh, counter metropolitan politics, for instance, right? I think the, the, the dimension of existence uh, needs in, even to um, separate itself from uh, the communitarian structure of self-defense, you know? And I think that the notion of community too is, uh, is complicated in Marcello Tari and it's perhaps a problem that we can, um, that we can discuss uh, further, right? In relation to, to existence. Okay, now I'll, I'll leave it here and, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Gerardo. Uh, that, I'm incredibly, I have questions. I'm very excited. Um, next up, we have Andres. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you to the organizers. Uh, in particular, thank you to uh, Hugh, uh, Malav, Bella, Erica, Steve, and Sean. 
uh, the rest of the panelists and organizers of Red May. <coughs> so um, rather than giving some sort of uh, critical uh, review of Daddy's book, um, I would like to dedicate my time, and it should be a little under 10 minutes, um, to trying to think with it and extend its line of thought and some topics, themes, and questions uh, that have um, that I've been occupied with lately. So uh, most all of my reflection here is going to revolve around the question of, of, of immigration, of undocumented immigration, uh, and, and, and things that are going on with regard to that or have been going on um, for several years now. So my first question is if and to what extent a movement of and for undocumented people um, must be a destituent process. So I'm referring here to both the movement, uh, the physical movement of people um, and a movement in a more political sense. So historically, activism around undocumented people um, has held that normalization of status and thus legal recognition and protection um, as one of its primary aims, right? So even while the very phenomenon of undocumented immigration itself entails a forceful rejection of the authority of a nation state and its law uh, to restrict the movement of people. Uh, to restrict where they can live and make a life, right? So there's a tension between the act of undocumented immigration, uh, which can be read as an act of refusal of legal authority, uh, an act through which a foreign uh, and devalued element forces its way inside a juridical political space, uh, an act in which something fundamentally out of place uh, lays claim to the very place to which it doesn't belong. Um, and then the political horizon that uh, we often find in the immigrant rights movement, right? Where precisely around the question of rights, where the state and its law remain um, central categories. <coughs> so my aim to be clear is not to fault those who work for immigrant rights, uh, but to nevertheless point out how restricting our strategic vision to rights uh, implies um, acquiescing to and legitimizing the legal and institutional structures that make possible and indeed necessary the existence of the undocumented uh, immigrant in the first place. Um, so can a constituent power within a framework of the nation state ever avoid reproducing the foundational distinction between citizen and non-citizen, right? Between those who legitimately belong and those who do not and the racial class and criminological criteria uh, through which this distinction is established. So what would it mean to think destitution from the perspective of unauthorized immigration? Um, what potential does it hold for figuring a different form of life in the now? Um, and I just propose some preliminary thoughts regarding this through, um, through sanctuary on the one hand and the migrant caravans on the other. So one of the salient characteristics of sanctuary today is its initiation and a refusal to cooperate with the state's deportation orders, effectively creating a space exempted from the latter's jurisdiction, and thus creating a certain state of exception. Um, while sanctuary tends to appeal to moral or religious law when it is brought into being within you know, a place of worship, it, organizing around sanctuary in recent years um, has also broadened its locations, meaning, and function. So uh, it has shifted the balance from rallying around a humanitarian and defensive position to turning sanctuary into a place where the protection of immigrants is coupled with anti-capitalist, anti-racist, and anti-imperialist struggle. As Harsha Walia and her comrades recount in Undoing Border Imperialism, sanctuary can, in some cases uh, has, become a site for the radical reconfiguration of social relations. Now, um, it is in this sense that we can think about the becoming commune of sanctuary. Um, sanctuary, after all, is linked to the production of territory and even to the production of revolutionary territory as posited by Tari, uh, quoting him. <coughs> if we use the term in its original meaning, Tari suggests, we might therefore think of territories entering into revolutionary becoming as a kind of outside internal to the metropolis, a space of common use, one that tends to remove itself from power, law, and metropolitan terror, end quote. 
Along similar lines, uh, Walia notes how, quote, creating zones of safety for non-status migrants is a tangible way to articulate our rejection of and simultaneously prefigure alternatives to border imperialism, in, uh, end quote. Uh, the notion of a zone of safety um, implies a space that one protects and in turn gives protection to people without authorized status. The type of safety it produces, moreover, is radically antagonistic to the framework of security that supports the state's use of force and grounds its administrative reason. Safety in this context refers to the demarcation of a space that not only protects people without authorized status uh, from the force of the state, but enables a collective prefiguration, a creation in the now of a different form of sociality based on uh, egalitarian collective praxis explicitly antagonistic to the very premises of capitalism and the state. Uh, we might even refer to this as a type of anti-security politics, right? Whereas security is an attempt to preempt or contain the disruptive force of contingency that obtains from the fact that society and the law can never be sutured into a whole. Sanctuary as an anti-security politics implies holding open an exceptional space. Quote, taking a position a hundred times a day, living in the state of exception, this is what living in revolutionary times means, uh, Tari tells us. This, is, this also figures sanctuary as a kind of stasis, right? Drawing from Nicole Leroux, Tari uh, underscores the double meaning of stasis. Quote, it relates to movement or agitation and also means uh, to stay still, stationary, and immobile ultimately signifying something like movement at rest, right? A suspension from which unprecedented possibilities can become real, end quote. So this paradoxical notion of movement at rest resonates with the way in which sanctuary in its most radical instantiations develops a form of practice that creates and defends a territory whose reason for being is to render the law inoperative. Not simply defending the ability to move across space, sanctuary also defends the ability to, to create space. I mean, create place. Um, alongside sanctuary, um, I would like to briefly consider the migrant caravans, which in some ways resonate with sanctuary, but also do so in an obverse manner. Um, beginning in 2017, um, the migrant caravans have received much attention as a figure of exodus, right? a collective fleeing from not just poverty and violence, but from the ever harsher effects of climate change. <coughs> While the influx of Central Americans is not entirely new, what has changed is the collective nature of this movement, as thousands of people have begun gathering to force their movement across Central and in, in North America towards the U.S. southern border. For years, the policy of the U.S. and Mexico has been to make the trek from Central America more dangerous, taking measures like increasing the number of agents along migrant routes and increasing the speed of trains like La Bestia, uh, to make it more difficult and deadly for people to use as a means of transportation. The effect of this has been to push migrants towards more isolated routes uh, that make them more vulnerable to assault, extortion, and kidnapping. Um, the migrant caravans are highly visible in collective refusal of this dynamic. It is precisely this collective dimension that has transformed such a movement of people into a force of destitution, I would argue. Albeit not without setbacks, um, the force of numbers has allowed the caravan in various instances to directly force their way across checkpoints and police blockades, thus also rendering um, state force and legality inoperative. What makes them see in the caravans a poor and racialized horde can also be linked to the dislocation and destitution of identities resulting from the collective experience of movement. While this collective exodus undoes and reconfigures social bonds, it also revives communal forms like assemblies and traditions of mutual aid in the production of an exceptional territory in movement. So what we have in the sanct with sanctuary is in a sense of becoming commune in a place. Here we also have a, a kind of becoming commune um, in movement, right? Of a place in movement as well. So they, they, they kind of fit together in a kind of obverse relationship. So I believe one would not be mistaken in seeing the caravan as a continuation, in some cases, the reemergence of indigenous resistance, communal forms of life. And here thinking precisely on Tari's discussion of, of, um, of tradition, right? Um, and the interruption of that tradition as well, as it kind of 
comes back into existence. Um, in some cases, their emergence of indigenous resistance, communal forms of life, and even traces of black fugitivity in maroon communities. So indeed, in some ways, the caravans can be said to coincide with Kropotkin's assertion that, quote, commune no longer means a territorial agglomeration. It is rather a generic name, a synonym for the grouping of equals, which knows neither frontiers nor walls. And that's where I'll stop my comments um, right now. And I can return to some of that in the Q&A, maybe. Wonderful. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Andres. I just, uh, I wanted to say very briefly um, that the way that you're talking about sanctuary um, is what, it, it fits so well with what Tari is asking for in replacing the subject with the situation. Um, there's a way that uh, on the struggle of undocumented people means you can't locate it, as you said, like in the individual, but instead there's a shift towards um, not just placemaking, but this antagonism um, and uh, the insistence on uh, or making the situation um, inextricably antagonistic to the state um, is just super powerful. Um, thank you for your observations. Um, okay. And um, next up we have Idris. Okay. So I um, just want to start out and say shout out to the Red May people because you guys always hold me down for like years now, right? And um, pick up the Common Notions people as well. I know forever. And thank you, Bella, for doing the, for moderating this and also for your help during the reading group. Very insightful comments during our reading group. We read the Tari book together with a couple other comrades. Um, also, okay, another thing. First off, I want to also give a... a extend my solidarity to the uprising in Colombia and remind everyone that Friday, May 28th is the National Day of Action and Solidarity with the strike. As Phil said, it's also the day I'm giving uh, another, doing another presentation for Red May, but if you have a choice to either get ignorant in the street or listen to my talk, I want you to go get ignorant and not listen to me at all, my babble. And everyone who's listening, hopefully uh, find some way to kick it off in your city on Friday. All right, well, with all that said, so to the subject at hand, all right? So uh, it's kind of weird to talk about a book, like one particular book in this kind of setting, right? And usually if you ask me about a book, I would like say, okay, this book is dope, or this book is whack. Like, and that's about it. That's as far as we typically go. Um, so I like it, it's good. You know, you might want to read it. You should read it probably. Also props to Tari for being, for working as what he calls a barefoot researcher. Uh, so respect him for, for refusing to submit to what I've called the academic death machine. Um, but if I had to say more, I'd say that uh, what I like about Tari's book or why I'm into it is that he chooses to focus on Benjamin's critique of violence essay, right? Um, Walter Benjamin's critique of violence. And um, even though the critique of violence is you know, very obscure and aphoristic, there's a lot of meat on the bones of that text, right? You know, one line, uh, you can write probably an, uh, one, uh, an essay on each line of it, right? So by walking alongside Benjamin, I think that Tari is able to develop a much more comprehensive theory of constituent power than uh, some of the more other more vague, you know, and sparse accounts. And this is important for me for, uh, for you know, political reasons as well, not just theoretical reasons. Whenever a new, new revolutionary term hits the scene, you know, it comes to mean about, it comes to mean both everything and nothing almost as soon as it's coined, right? And then four years later, we have to develop a new one and that becomes just as empty. Uh, um, and, you know, so, you know, I, I have a feeling and, you know, decision power, just like say insurrection will come to mean a community garden very soon, right? Uh, you know, they'll just get sapped of everything that might be powerful within it, every clarifying power that it might have. So, you know, I, you know, I had to give props to Tari for, you know, just engaging seriously with Benjamin's thought because, you know, it's an intellectual struggle, uh, especially to get through Benjamin. And it, that helps to counteract this kind of tendency of, you know, emptying out the terminology. Um, also, if you notice, too, in the text, he deals with uh, not just with the critique of violence, but a lot of the other really short, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, Short and also long, like uh, text that he that Benjamin did at the time, 
in the early 20, 1920s where, you know, he's pouring over kind of the German romantics and, you know, it's really easy to get lost in that maze that Benjamin is going through at this time. And I don't think he even knows his way so well, Benjamin, at this point. So, you know, there have been times where, you know, I start to try to, you know, hone in on one Benjamin term uh, that Tari, you know, does a really good job of just getting at the right, uh, the most important side of it instead of getting lost in, in you know, the pedantics. Um, but what else do I want to say? I want to say that... Uh, I also think it's good that Tari, he says he resists reading Benjamin as all the professional academics do, as he doesn't look at Benjamin as quote unquote, one of the great writers of the 20th century. He says, quote, that to read Benjamin is to, to feel his revolutionary potential that pulsates below the crust of history, end quote. And, you know, you know Benjamin is of course, ex extremely popular in, in academia, but you know, they always pretty much get him wrong. and. Tari gets him right because he reads him in this way. You know, he walks alongside Benjamin. Uh, and I think that's the only way we can understand what he means by a pure violence that destitutes the law. Um, also, one of the other reasons why I think it's important for him to focus on Benjamin is that Benjamin gives us a very concrete example of what destitution might look like. And that's what he gets from Sorel, the, the proletarian general strike. Um, now, on the flip side, I think in an American context, there is some need to be pedantic in our exegetical interpretations of Benjamin or just any text that, uh, that you know, Americans in continental philosophy or critical theory or conflict take from the Europeans, right? So, you know, um, there's probably millions of examples that other people can give of this, but, you know, my example is, you know, I was, in a, I was at this talk on Fanon and, you know, some fancy professor walks up and tries to convince everyone that Fanon's on violence is somehow a screed on pacifism, right? So uh, one thing, you know, we have to do, I, th I think is important is to say, okay, look, like, this is just not what Fanon says. And in the same way, when Benjamin talks about, uh, you know, divine violence and pure violence, he means violence, right? You know, there's no way to get around this, right? Uh, another tendency that you see in the American Academy uh, as was demonstrated by in Francois Cassette's book, um, is that there's a trend for American intellectuals to take thinkers from the continent and kind of blend them all together. So they say, so they all say the same thing, you know, that they're all, even though uh, they have very different approaches, somehow they can just be blended together into one homogenous mob, like blob of, uh, of thought, right? And um, I think the situation power that, you know, there's the tendency that this could happen with the situation power. And what I want to point out is that Tari very much diverges from Agamben uh, in his notion of the situation power by preserving kind of the violence, the negativity and the destruction that Agamben actually kind of uh, takes out of it at this point around 2014 when he gives his talk on it. Um, you know, there, there are very different ways that people are conceptualizing it from Tranti to Agamben to Tari and it's important to make these distinctions, right? And we can understand these distinctions by looking at the way that Tari reads Benjamin. Um, so people are probably tired of hearing my talk on Destituent Power and I still haven't gotten around to writing it up, but I wanna underline uh, the part of it where I go back to the part of it where I talked about Benjamin's notion of pure and divine violence and how it entailed kind of this destructive concept of deposing or destituting the law. Um, and this, I wanted, to, and in that talk, I wanted to counteract Agamben's reading or his newer reading of kind of Benjamin performing a messianic inversion uh, as a form of destitution. And for, for Agamben, he argued, at least in the later texts and in, in the past 10 years, that, uh, that the destituent approach to the law doesn't destroy the law, but saps it of its force and its energy. So the law is left behind as a kind of remnant that you can play with, right? And if you look at Benjamin and if you read, if you read Benjamin or you read Tronti, uh, one of the things that they really emphasized was that there was a destruction of the law. So, and I, I, on purely exegetical grounds, if you read the critique of violence, he tells us again and again, Benjamin tells us again and again that manifestations of pure violence must encompass some form of destruction, annihilation and revolution, right? We note that uh, Agamben wants to kind of distance himself from revolution in, in some of these texts. 
Um, in fact, Benjamin wholly identifies the proletarian general strike in the most unequivocal and clear terms with the capacity to destroy. So I'm gonna quote Benjamin here. He writes that in contrast to the political general strike, the proletarian general strike sets itself the sole task of destroying and um, okay, pardon my German and I'm still practicing my dual lingo. He uses Vernichtung, destroying state power, right? There's, he, he, in, you know, uh, in tons and tons of synonyms for destroying German that Benjamin uses. It should be noted also that for Benjamin, destruction is assigned a crucial theoretical function in marking a distinction between impure mythical violence and pure divine violence. So we can argue for this on, uh, on exegetical grounds in the sense that, or you know, through his reading of fables, right? So on the one hand, Benjamin tells us that a mythic manifestation of legal violence does not amount to destruction, all right? So the violence of the law doesn't, uh, doesn't go all the way to complete annihilation or destruction because it always has to fall short of total obliteration in order to leave someone high behind who's vanquished or guilty, uh, you know, to be punished. So um, this complete destruction is always held back because you have to have, the law needs to have a victim to undergo the pain of punishment, to, to a body to take on the punishment. So the, the example that Benjamin gives is of Niobe, right? Niobe is left as a stone on the mountain, both to suffer for her hubris and to mark a hierarchical distinction between God and humanity, right? So mythical violence of the law never fully destroys. It always leaves something behind, right? And it needs something behind to punish and something behind to mark a distinction in, in the hierarchy. Now, on the other hand, the example of biblical pure divine violence for Benjamin always measures up the destruction, all right? Because it has a totalizing scope that leaves no survivors behind. So the example that Benjamin gives us from the Old Testament and it's when the God rains down fire uh, in which each and every sinner is incinerated by the flame. So this is how, you know, God strikes the privileged Le of Levites. And Benjamin says, he does not stop short of annihilation, right? Everyone is zapped by God in divine violence. Um, now I gave two, so these are kind of more textual arguments, but I gave two philosophical arguments about why downplaying the destructive revolutionary character of Benjamin and pure violence just can't withstand an imminent critique, right? So if we begin with Benjamin's, uh, we begin with Benjamin's premises, the conclusion has to lead us to a destructive conception of pure violence. Um, and looking at Agamben again, if, you know, first, Agamben is pressed to distance his notion of pure means, right? Pure violence is a pure means from any form of action or activity. And instead, Agamben wants to relate it to this potentiality not to, all right? Um, and this is a really difficult thing to do, but um, it, it's, been, it's a very paradoxical notion, but it's really impossible to think of means that somehow does not involve an action. A pure means without an end is a very paradoxical notion, but we just can't even get a hold of what a means is without having some notion of action attached to it. So if you look at Kant's classic definition of means in his account of the categorical imperative, he recognizes that means and actions are just variable synonyms, right? He uses them interchangeably, Kant does. So, and in fact, once you notice, even Adam himself slips off and describes a means as an action or an auto in Italian, right? So it's really hard just to even get a grip of means without action. So, but what Adam really worried about is that he's trying to make an action, trying to sever action from means because, because he just doesn't want the, the end to uh, an ends as a concrete actuality in the constitutive power of the state. You know, I think Agama's problem is that he wants to, you know, sever means from action because a means will nevertheless give, or action will nevertheless give way to a result. And that result for him is always some sort of constituted power or, uh, um, or what Benjamin would call law preserving violence, right? But what I argue is that if the action is destructive, then this can't and won't occur. Uh, so if it's a destructive action, then the state will be wiped away by the very act. So to put the argument in short, you can't sever means from action, but the only action that will not lead to the recreation of another state is for it to be a destructive action.
Um, the second argument that I put forward in that talk is that um, Agamben fails to note that if mythic violence is not the, is a, a non-immediate self-manifestation of the law, then the mythic violence of the state is always truly an end in itself. All right. So what do I mean by this? For Benjamin, mythic violence, the violence of the law, state violence, state power is always just a sheer objectification of power. So this implies that the very existence of the law itself is mythic violence, right? You know, the violence that the law exerts is the law itself. And the law only works by exerting its existence through domination. So put in another way, the force of the law is simply the law itself and there's no difference between the two, all right? It follows that there is no deactivation of the law and Agamben wants to deactivate the law. He wants to sap the force of the law. Um, but if the force of the law were removed through the law, the law itself would be destroyed. If the law itself, its existence is its very power, the very deactivation of the law is the destruction of the law. Hence, the only way to get rid of the law is by destroying it. So that in this way, there's nothing left to play with. This kind of uh, Kafka's notion of, you know, in the final messianic times, we'll play with the law as, uh, um, as children play with toys, you know, the real in the real messianic times and 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 uh there'll be nothing left to play with at all we'll be playing with nothing um i also wanted to point out one last thing and i i think that uh if, if i was to give a reason to read tari's text another important reason to read tari's text is that you know he really pays attention to some problems that i think are plaguing the movement now or problems that have been thrown up by the movement now or by the the, the wealth of movements now one thing he looks at is uh, he compares um, Benjamin's proletarian general strike to not only Sorrell's general strike, but also the Luxembourg's mass strike. And what he tells us is that by reading Benjamin through Luxembourg, it makes us conceive of a strike as something that is unfolding. It's a process that unfolds within a larger process of revolution, all right? And I think this is important because you know, I think every country now is meeting these kinds of starts and stops, right? Was it maybe last summer in Colombia, uh, there was the uprising against the police murder and now we have the uprising today, right? Uh, we had the uprising for George Floyd in the summer and hopefully we have enough, uh, another uprising this summer, but we're seeing these kind of discontinuous jointed start and stops and Tari's giving us some tools to work through how we should understand uh, you know, uh, constituent power is a process that unfolds and a process that unfolds in a larger process of revolution. So I don't wanna say, you know, get into the analysis of how he actually explains this to us, but it's something important for us to grapple with, I think today on, on a practical level. Um, also, he gives us another important topic to take into hand is how to coordinate the various uprisings that have been going on throughout the world. And, um, he starts with the Argentinian uprising, and uh, as which is where the term constituent power was coined by Colectivo Situaciones. Um, and he understands Colectivo Situaciones' uh, conception of constituent power in the Argent Argentinian uprising of 2001 as a paradigm in the very technical sense of the term, all right? He's getting this from Agamben in uh, what is a paradigm in the signature of all things. But it goes back to Enzo Melandri, uh, the great Italian philosopher, the very unread, underappreciated Italian philosopher. Uh, um, to think of a paradigm, uh, an insurrection or decision power as a paradigm means that we can understand how it can unfold in another field, in another context, yet without just duplicating it, uh, copying it, replicating it as a mirror image. All right. And I think this offers us some ideas of how we can understand how, uh, you know, in his example, how we got from Argentina in 2001 to the Bonley year riots in 2005, uh, to the Greek uprising in 2008, to the world, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it revolution, but the world kind of temper tantrum of 2011, right? To our 2014 of Black Lives Matter, the first round, right? The, which was a little bit uh, um, a little bit more digestible to now our more negative round in 2020. And um, with that said, uh, his best evidence for the paradigmatic status of the Argentinian uprising is that 
we heard there, KN Todos, right? Everyone out, nobody stays. But then, you know, years later in Tunisia in 2011, we heard just leave or even throughout the Arab world again and again that the people want to bring the regime down. And we're having this echo throughout the world. And Tari is trying to give us some important tools and how to coordinate this and think this better. And with that said, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Idris. Um, I, I, I believe that there will be some hot debate, uh, <laughs> but I just wanted I wanted to flag briefly um, what you were saying about the uh, just is it um, that makes me think of uh, what Andres was saying um, about. Uh, sanctuary, because um, there's this uh, from Marx and Grundrisse, there's this the institution of the city um, uh, with the wall is like the city was actually defined with the wall itself and that connects with Tari's um, uh, understanding that government has shifted to an infrastructural uh, power. Um, sovereignty is now uh, at its infrastructure. So thinking of like the wall and the actual city like um, breaking down if the law is uh, its force is achieved through this cybernetic, through this metropolitan means, um, actually breaking down the city um, starts to look like that breaking down of the wall, um, which has some great uh, ideas for horizons of the commune, et cetera. All right, sorry, Richard, it's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, you can hear me all right, yeah? Great. Um, I am slightly overwhelmed by the past three uh, contributions. And so I'm gonna try and vaguely organize my thoughts between, uh, yeah, I'll, draw, I'll, get, I'll get to that. Anyway, um, thank, the first thing is thanks everyone for, for organizing the show. Thanks to Red May, thanks Bella for uh, moderating. Uh, Malav isn't here, but I just want to say thanks to him because uh, he got me in on the project for translating the book, which was extremely enjoyable. Um, just so that everyone is clear, I'm, I'm the translator, so I'm got nowhere going to be up to scratch uh, on your level of philosophizing, because translating is mainly monkey work of just figuring out how to get between uh, one system of symbols to another. Um, and reading a lot of footnotes, so I'll, I'll do the classic translator thing of getting into the minutiae of the text. Um, I, I'll try and uh, split my thoughts into um, and my reaction to some of the really fascinating things you said into two things. One, uh, just a bit about, I'm going to try and make it into place and time. So on the one hand, I'll, I'll begin just by putting into the, the kind of geographical context of this kind of text, which is being parachuted into uh, post-COVID United States um, uh, out of a kind of weird post-economic crisis Europe and like so I'll just put some of, I'll just first put some of the kind of coordinates the geographical coordinates of what's going on there and and what's happening in 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 his notes um and then maybe get on to what that time period means and I, I'd really like us to also get on to maybe talking about what does it mean to talk about de uh, destituent power and the 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 the, the paradigm that uh, Marcello um, outlines what does that mean in our in our current moment um, so in case there are people who are listening are watching who haven't read the book you'll have got by now that the book is essentially and I maybe you, you someone was going to argue with me here the book is essentially an uh, a rally cry an encouragement to be an insurrectionary revolutionary that that is the point of the book, right? Um, it's not it's not a treatise on on, um, on on Heidegger or Benjamin, though it ends up at points being a treatise on Heidegger and Benjamin. But it's basically um, a call for people to be insurrectionary revolutionary activists. Um, I'm not sure I am an insurrectionary revolutionary activist. Uh, um, it was really nice to uh, hear your contribution, Andres, because in fact. The, the political activity I'm involved in in Italy is migrant solidarity um, in a very different context. Um, but it's certainly your, your, your way of thinking about sanctuary and, and the caravans and exodus, and I throw in the word asylum, 
um, there, which is another way of thinking about sanctuary, really uh, was really interesting and brought together some thoughts that I hadn't connected. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, so the, the book is a rally cry and it, it's very reminiscent of a text which he cites. And I don't know how much these texts um, are, are, are well known in the States. Maybe you'll tell me, Richard, of course we know all this stuff. Uh, but there was the text in 2008, the call, um, or the, the, in the whole, maybe it was 2011 it came out. We can have a look. But there was a, it was a pamphlet that went around all of the social centers and all of the book fairs, and they just printed it off in translations everywhere. And it was, it was a call to be insurrectionary activists. And it bridged from Tikkun, which was the, the, the French journal that was desperately trying to get the most radical thought it could out of Agamben. And it bridged over into the Invisible Committee, which I know uh, all of you guys in the States know the Invisible Committee very well because it's been highly translated and put out with a good amount of funding, whereas Tikkun didn't get that treatment. Um, but Tikkun is also really good. And so Marcello um, Tari has a strange p position, even I think within the, the, the niche culture that is the ultra, ultra, ultra left um, of standing, of being an Italian in France. Like that is his weird position. Um, and I think maybe that doesn't come across in the book because the book is now in English. So he's now an Italian France translated into English citing Germans and talking about Russia. So it kind of gets lost along the way. But in Italian, it's really clear that he's not engaging in any contemporary Italian debates. Right. He kind of he slightly talks about the five star movement. He's uh, talking a little about the populists, but the French comrades uh, get what he's talking about in a really different way. Um, so, so my, my thanks to you know, um, my comrades in France who explain this to me because I read French very badly. Um, because in France, there is this critique of the metropolis in a much, much stronger way. And I think you're yeah, you're right to, to focus on that. And one of the things he does is he links that back to the critiques of the metropolis that were coming out of the 1970s Italian movement. Um, and if you look at some of the, um, unfortunately untranslated, but really uh, fun side of that kind of militant movement where there's a lot of like comics and graphic arts and a lot of mm, the kind of the nudist colonies of the 1970s of like radical Italy, where they're, they're trying to be nudists and terrorists at the same time. And you don't know, you know, what's a butt and what's a gun and it's all weird. There's, there's a lot of critique of the metropolis and they do these kind of big posters of like naked babies running through the metropolis with like a rifle, and, you know, they, they, and in France now, that's really taken on. So the French activists, like the ultra left in France, they're, 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 the way they organize is basically, you have your commune in the countryside, you take care of your goats, you grow your cucumbers, and then on the weekend, you go to Paris, you throw some Molotovs, and then you go back to your countryside. So if you're in France and you read Marcello's book, it makes that whole side of it makes a lot more sense, right? It's about that kind of exodus and refuge and asylum and sanctuary away from the metropolis where you get to do your thing. And the, the point where Italy and France meet on that is their movement against the high-speed railway, which may not seem obvious, but and he, Marcello mentions it at one point, the TAV, which is the high-speed railway that connect, is meant to connect northern Italy to southern France. And it's basically meant to get businessmen from Milan to Paris really quickly. Um, and it's the, one of the longest standing social movements in Italy. Um, I'm not very connected to it because I live in the south of Italy and this is in the north of Italy and the near the twain shall meet. Um, and that's a really, really radical and violent movement against the metropolis, against cybernetics, against um, this kind of uh, ultra um, industrialization and commercialization of a rural context, right? So I think one of the, the, the debates that actually is coming out of this book when he's talking about destitution and, and constitution is, I mean, the French comrades would argue with me about this, but is a kind of like a uh, countryside and city debate, right? It's, it's about what can you do in different contexts? How can you move? What kind of activism 
uh, can you be a part of? The metropolis represents the polis, right? It is the party, it's the politics in that sense. You move away from it, that's not what you're going to be doing and you have to engage in a different way. And I think that's a kind of activist context that's quite useful to understanding maybe some of the, the, philosopher, the philosophical concepts that are battling their way out through those pages. Um, I think another, another interesting thing that's going on geographically with the book is, um, is what's going on with Germany in it. So in Germany, Germany in the book, it has no activist context. It just comes out uh, like Idris pointed out um, very eloquently um, in a really radical reading of, of Benjamin. Um, and I agree, I think still, I, I agree with you, it's the correct reading and it's, it's the reading that um, my comrades in London have been following for a long time, um, where you're really trying to find that uh, crazy anarchist messianic spirit that comes out of the First World War, everything is in ruins and Benjamin transforms a totally esoteric language philosophy into the most radical thing that he can find, uh, which is, is kind of messianic Bolshevism. Um, it's worth saying that at that point, he's also very much in contact with Azialachis, who is the revolutionary uh, Bolshevik theater maker. Um, and he, he collaborates with her on a lot of it. And a lot of the energy is coming out of that. Um, but Germany appears then also as um, in, in a couple of moments, it exists in, there's that weird, there's a weird Benjamin fragment late on in the book, which is, um, which is mainly studied in the context of how it was used and, and uh, reinterpreted by the Red Army faction uh, in Germany, right? So he, he, he kind of focuses in on a really radical Benjamin that has its own tradition. So it's, he's not the first one, right? I mean, you, you know that. He's not the first one that's trying to reuse Benjamin in that way. Instead, he's kind of pointing out, look, Benjamin has been used by, thought through by radical Frankfurt school thinkers who have connections to violent terroristic, left terrorist movements. Um, he then goes to uh, East Germany, is looking for the most radical and kind of terroristic things he can find in East Germany as well. And so it's just your, um, your first uh, comment, Gerardo, was about tradition and that he's trying to reject the tradition. I think it's, for me, and maybe we could talk about it, um, it felt very much like this, it, the book is also a restitution where it is a moment of saying, okay, I've been an activist for 20 years. I've been in all these collectives. We have gone through a journey. We have read Agamben in a certain way. We have found our new coordinates. Here is the restitution. And he brings together a whole set of coordinates going from South America to Bolshevik Russia, to East Germany, to West Germany, to France, bringing together to make a new tradition. And I think it's really, I think one of the, I hope one of the effects of this, this small text is to kind of propel it into a different public that can then discover uh, all of those other coordinates, uh, which are not only European coordinates, but many of them are. Um, there's obviously a question to be asked about what happens when you start to concretize a set of coordinates like that. Maybe they stop being quite as flexible as they would like to be. What gets left out? Uh, what's in there, what's not? Um, which, which, is, which is a whole set of questions. Um, yeah, so that, and that kind of brings on, I'll just move on to the idea of, of the time framework of, of what this book is doing, which is the book is written in, uh, 2016 comes out in came out in 2017. Um, it's already translated into French. Um, and the moment it comes out of, and I think Idris, what you were saying about these different this kind of um, breakups and fragmentary moments of of insurrectionary activity that we that we see in different countries, I think is very much the spirit he is in when he writes it saying like, okay, we've got a really extraordinary insurrectionary movement going on in France. Uh, and it kind of comes in stops and starts. And so he writes the book in a moment in 2016 where maybe it felt like 
we're going to push through again and it doesn't happen um last year france again paris was there was a huge wave of riots and street movements com completely extraordinary certainly um uh, as big as 2016 um and very much uh, from from the ground up So he writes the book in 2016 in a moment where he thinks it's going to push on. It doesn't push on. As we know, things don't particularly get, go, get better and better in Europe. In fact, the right is just gaining strength um, until we get this, this incredibly weird 18 months that we've all lived through. And I was, it was really a very strange experience translating the book last year, a book which is entirely about what happens when the world comes to a halt. What happens when you have a when the entire global working class stops doing things? What happens when there's a pause? What happens when everyone holds back? What happens when people leave the cities and go to the countryside? Like it really was, and it's strange, he talks about paradigms and that there's a great deal of, you know, he, he, he draws on Agamben's work on the paradigm. It's a paradigmatic work, um, maybe prophetic uh, to, 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 to use his terminology. And it, um, I think it's very striking and maybe just to leave on a slightly uh, pessimistic note but or provocative one I think what, I, uh, what you said Idris about uh, destituent power could just become you know a community a word for a community garden very soon uh, and I agree with you language just gets emptied out like that I wonder how much uh, the last 18 months have seen exactly that right like we've, we, we, we've we've had the um, the, the, the subsumption, the cultural subsumption of the mass global proletarian strike, which is, we just did it. We had the moment in which the world comes to a halt and it turns out it wasn't revolutionary. Um, and we've had to create a whole language about asylum, which turns out was isolation. Uh, a whole language about withdrawal, which wasn't the strike. Um, a whole language about how do we connect with each other in new ways, which just turned out to be cybernetics once uh, over and again. That's not to say that we can't find counter discourses and so on, but um, I think it, it does feel like the past year ends up being a synthesis of some of the conflicts in the book. And so now the question is, where do we go? What do we do with the rubble of the concepts that we developed over the past 10, 20 years to talk about insurrection when uh, they've been put to the test? And I don't think anything happened as uh, the way we thought it would. On that strange note, I will, I will pass over. Wonderful, Richard. You were too humble uh, <laughs> at the beginning. Um, is uh, It's so important to hear uh, the history um, in which the book was written, um, the details and the geography. Uh, and I just wanted, to, and you're right to like have this par parachuted into this particular moment, which is both like in the US uh, one, but also this uh, greater global context. It made me think of um, a quote uh, from the book. Um, so if I could just read that briefly, because it, it speaks to this moment of restitution. Um, and uh, though Fred Moten called it momentum in repose, because um, there is this discontinuity, yeah, that we're seeing in movements. Um, and so to have Tari write a book to kind of compose um, and draw out this lineage and take a, uh, take a moment of restitution, um, I, I think is really right. Uh, so on page 99, um, Tari writes, um, finally, it is where we find the possibility of a crossroads in the path of history, a world our memory is a part of, if we are able to use it in the sense of remembrance and not as a reserve of resentment. To go beyond resistance, we must position the territory within a becoming world. This time, the wall built against our enemy will not be made of concrete, but of time itself. And then skipping down a little bit further to go to this unin uninhabitable world that we live in. No one can truly live within the uninhabitable. What we can begin to inhabit is neither the metropolis nor the territory, but the excess of the antagonistic relation between them, the remainder. Um, and so I just thought that that spoke to the countryside, the city, um, the wall, but also how we are to manifest this 
uh, resistance, which isn't necessarily going to be, as he says, made of concrete, um, but instead of time um, and coming through COVID, I think that re probably resonates with a lot of people um, and resonates with what uh, Idris was saying earlier as well. Um, okay, so uh, let's get to the questions. Um, is that all right? Or uh, did you, uh, uh, Gerardo, I know you had a lot of thoughts. Um, and so I also wanted to open up the space to you to, if you wanted to respond to anything um, that anyone said after, since you were the first person to speak. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for your, um, your moderation and your, your comments and, and everyone else who, who, who intervene. I do have a lot of questions. Um, uh, I don't know where to begin. But um, I think that just to throw something out there, um, not just to Idris, um, but to the panel, uh, it, it's, I think, something that opens up and, and pushes the book forward because I don't, in my opinion, in my reading, I don't think it's, it's, um, it's directly thematized. Um, I think the book invites to, for us to think about that question. Um, but it's a question that now that Richard also mentioned France, I think it's, it's, um, it has been present recently, if we read um, the, the, the website, right, the page uh, Lundi Matin, uh, the question of violence. And, and I, I do agree with Idris that the question of violence is, is, pre is present in, in a very profane way, right, in, in Tari's book. And, and it's a question that I think hits the mark because the world, right, is, is full of pacifists and, and new humanists, right? Um, even the left, as I think Marcello mentions in the book, right, the, the, le the left in, in Spain, for instance, has become a party of order and family, for instance, right? Uh, and so the, more, more than ever, I think the question of violence is, is a central question for the epoch, you know? But I guess one question that I want to raise is, um, is it, is it a limitation, right? Um, is it still a limitation in relation to the tradition, you know? Insofar as the tradition is also the, 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 the different articulations of epochs of political theology at the end of the day, right, in the West. Um, is it a limitation that the question of violence in Tari is still embedded in the vocabulary of political theology? You know, which I think there he does share with with Agamben, even though Idris, I do um, I do grant right the, the the different nuances that you that you pointed out, right? But I think a, first, I guess the question is, does it matter that it's in the vocabulary and in the horizon of political theology, or can violence be uh, thought outside of political theology? You know, so I think that some French friends have made the attempt. I think that Afro pessimism also, right? But that's just a general question that I have. You know, uh, if uh, to, to make it a little bit more personal, uh, Gerardo and I were at uh, the diner where Goodfellas was filmed and we had this discussion about violence. So it, it was, uh, we started it at least. I think I might've gotten too drunk to finish it. But, um, uh, I, in terms of political theology, it, it's a little strange, right? Um, and and I, I think even Agamben is a little bit, he's a little bit more ambivalent, right? You know, if you, in the use of bodies in the last installment of the Homo Sacra series, he, uh, you know, he talks about moving beyond political theology at some point, right? Uh, where I, I, I don't, I didn't pick that up in Tari, maybe he does say it, but um, it, at least for uh, the frame, like Benjamin's framework, I want to say that you know, um, it, it's just very much, it, he doesn't want to leave it. It's very much the first thesis of the, of the thesis of history, right? That, you know, materialism needs theology in order for it to be, in order for it to do what it needs to do. Dialectical materialism needs theology, right? Like Jewish mysticism is something that we have to weaponize alongside Marx, you know, uh, Sabbatai, Sevi and Engels need to fight it out together. Um, uh, as for violence, uh, um, hmm. I, 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 I want to just keep it within political theology. I, I, at least my, I myself, whenever I find myself speaking about politics, at least in an American framework, and maybe it's because this is the way America has been shaped by, you know, all these, uh, uh, you know, um, religious refugees 
conquering and, and killing plundering, you know, and the, the tradition of also uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, it seems like for whatever reason, uh, I lean towards the political theology and, I, and maybe it's not fully thought out, but I think it has some sort of reson it resonates in America in some way that uh, has to be utilized. You guys probably say something better. I'll chime in. Um, I think, I think what you're saying about um, the different traditions in different countries is 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 very relevant, um, and and the the conflicts that exist there. And and I appreciate very much what you're saying about um, the spiritual context of uh, of of political discourse in the states, um, which has its has its. Very, has a very specific character. I think with, um, I think the Tari is trying to, it, consciously or not, is working very much within one side of the Frankfurt School debate, right? He's on, he, he's with Heidegger, he's, he's over there. So he talks, you know, he opens the book talking about time and space and universe and bone and flesh and people, right? He, he leads with those kind of uh, abstract, uh, concepts um, and he try he pushes his way through on that and the the kind of the detailed the cultural um, analyses are, are are kind of hidden away in in little patches. There's a point where he kind of criticizes people for for going out and taking too much MDMA. Um, there's the really lovely chapter about um, I think moving chapter about. Uh, post-revolutionary Russian architecture and where he talks about dwelling and what it means to dwell in a space. He has that um, lovely line that the, um, uh, the horizons of dwelling contain every revolt um, from Levinas. Um, but I, I kind of, I, I would take my distance from a, some of the, his approach there because my, at least my, my political formation or my you know, my reading groups and my comrades and so on are more on that other side of um, Krakow, Adorno, of trying to read through artworks and read through um, cultural production, what is happening in politics. And uh, Tari doesn't do that so much, right? He leads with politics. And I think it's absolutely, I think it's very much true that he leads with political th theology. That's where he's he's aiming at. And it's the same with Agamben, at least as far as my reading of Agamben, or certainly the recent works. He still, you know, he leads those concepts, and, and the cultural analyses are are few and far between. Um, and I think I would I would pose a criticism of that because I think it ends. Sometimes we end up. You get that feeling of kind of having a kind of something up your spine of of having of having kind of like this, this weird rigid form of trying to stick yourself into these concepts and trying to like mold yourself into weird philosophizing without having the cultural objects and the production of our friends of our groups of our comrades of our world of the media uh, that you can actually then move these concepts across which is usually how we communicate uh, around these things so I think it's sometimes a limit of the text and it's probably why in, in presenting it, I try to bring it back to what people are really doing, um, because otherwise the concepts start to they, they 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 start to get brittle and fall apart a bit if you talk about them too much. That that's my that's my Adornian argument against the book. Wonderful. We have so many questions. Um, coming in from uh, the people who are watching, uh, I'm I'm going to share them with you all now. <laughs> with that, uh, oh, just to say, Tari does have a paragraph devoted to uh, a brief analysis of the movie Gravity um, in the book. That is the one exception that I noticed. <laughs> um, Okay, so, uh, oh, and I also, so I wanted to thank um, Common Notions just in general for bringing us this book and, uh, <laughs> yes, and I wanted to, um, I heard that there were some watch parties happening. Um, and so I 
I wanted to thank everyone for getting together and turning this into a, a, a festive event where you can, I think in um, uh, Minneapolis and Chicago and uh, uh, several other cities. So the first question um, that we have came from the YouTube chat. Um, and uh, it's likely for Idris, but um, open obviously to anyone. Uh, the question is, um, does Benjamin's idea of divine law and general strike escape the law anew? Um, so specifically becoming another founding violence in the place of the law that it destroys. Um, and I can also, I'll put that in our, in our, in our chat so that everyone can, can see. So does Benjamin's idea of divine law and general strike escape from or overcome um, the potential of it forming a law anew? At least that's what it's intended to do. Um, uh, you know, the idea, at least Benjamin's idea, is that um, is that uh, there are two forms of violence that make up our world: con uh, constitute constituent violence and constituted violence. Or he calls them law-making violence or law-preserving violence. And there's an endless dialectic between the two that go back and forth. And, and that's basically the story of modernity. We have revolutions and then we have uh, uh, states that grow out of revolutions that become just as horrible as the states that we aim to replace. And his idea or the aim that he sets out for himself is how to break this. Um, so uh, with Agamben, as I said, um, his reading argues that constituent violence or divine violence or pure violence saps the energy out of the law and you know the law is something left to play with whereas Benjamin and he's very insistent about this that you know it's the complete destruction of the law it's escaping the dialectic of law preserving and law making violence so uh it's another question of whether he achieves this in this essay you know um uh when I address the problem I tried to bring it through a few different lenses. I tried to speak about it in terms of, also in terms of Aristotelian metaphysics and ontology. So how does potentiality relate to actuality or uh, dunamis to energia in the, in the ancient Greek? Um, also in uh, one way we can think of it and one way that has been thought about it is in terms of uh, Carl Schmitt's, you know, uh, state of exception and those analysis of sovereignty. So. You know, it's one question whether, you know, Benjamin would, can fulfill uh, uh, his aims and those aims can carry over into these different frameworks of how we understand the state, but he wants to completely destroy the law and, you know, and not have anything replace it. Otherwise, you just remain trapped in that dialectic. Okay, um, if no one else has anyone to say on that question, we'll move on to question two, uh, which is um, from uh, Shaman who uh, has appeared on Red Man, uh, who I think who's collaborated with Idris and others. Um, so uh, he asks, how is destituent power different from anarchist and anti-state communism? Um, is destituents the proper name for these movements beyond their ideological and mere political dimensions, or is it something new? Do you, should I take this one again? And then, then I'm going to shut up, all right? Uh, the, the, at least in my view, right, constituent power is different uh, because we take the, the anarchism and communism to fall within, you know, what uh, Benjamin Agam would call the cycle of democratic revolutions. So um, uh, in each case, you know, in each anarchist and communist revolution that have occurred, somehow the state is either left behind, left intact or a new state has come up, right? 
Uh, and in my diagnosis, I think this really goes back to the first days of the first international when, uh, you know, the distinction between communism and anarchism was immediately laid down. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, uh, the, um, the, the, the canonical Bakunin text, he tells us that the, the, the passion for destruction is a creative passion, but what gets created? It's a new state, a new law, or, or you know, or something. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, even with Marx, we'll see in many notions, many times we'll see, uh, um, especially in the Grundrisse, you, you'll note, uh, you know, he applauds kind of productive potentiality, a kind of Spinozan potentiality that's creative and productive. Where I see constituent powers breaking from the tradition is that it's a wholly negative, wholly, uh, a wholly negative, wholly destructive force. And, you know, it's hard to always think this through. And I think sometimes Tar even dithers here, but, you know, when he puts the formulation best is when he says, you know, uh, there'll be a destruction of the world, of the current world or the many worlds. And, you know, we piece together the remnants, you know, and we make those remnants singular. And therefore there's no, there's no creativity there. There's basically inhabiting what's left behind, you know, or like, what we pulled apart rather, right. um, but now I'll stop. And if I could, if I could jump in and say something about that, maybe um, I would. I think it, another interesting way that, um, that that can be thought, or at least um, become, it's it's always clear for me, is that um, well, there is the tradition of political anarchism where the state is the main unit of antagonism. But as Tari mentions throughout the book, right? If if uh, if the if the if the state form is already in crisis and we have a new rationality of governmentality, right, on of, of domination, right, then the question of anarchism is really uh, it, it should be a step back, right, <laughs> from a fetishization of of a of a uniform uh, um, of a sole form uh, of amity, and it becomes a way to suspend every principle. Right of uh, of um, leading or trying to dominate right a phenomena or a a world right so I I think here is the, the work of Rainer Schulman for instance right and uh, his reading of of the late Heidegger in relation to the crisis of principles right uh, anarchy in that sense uh, I think is uh, is important even to to um, to go beyond the the centrality of a particular political form. Right, and open it more towards the destitution of, of principles of domination that are proper to, to the history of metaphysics. No? I have more of a, <clears throat> I have a question actually uh, for Gerardo uh, related to this, in a sense, kind of returning your own question that you did made to Idris earlier, um, as far as, or with regard to something beyond or outside um, political theology. Uh, so basically, you know, um, I'm interested in hearing from you the relationship between destitution and uh, infer politics, right? Because it seems like from Idris's answer, then destitution is very much still within, within that, that uh, within the framework of political theology, right? Um, because something that I've always, so, so in a sense, you know, the relation between infopolitics and, and destitution, um, because there's a question of temporality as well, right? <clears throat> in your comments, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, a kind of undoing of the modern um, architectonics of the political, right? Drawing on Gali and, and others. Um, so in a sense, you know, what, what one has to deal with there in a sense is the exhaustion of a certain modern epochality, right? Um, how to think a break uh, that's not a break because the break is also part of very much of the modern, right? Um, and, th and then thus, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the necessity of a new vocabulary. Right, so in a sense, also these tensions or, or, or paradoxes because newness is as well. So the end and the new very much fit within modern epochality, right? So in some sense, there's a suspension of time is what is the sense that I get um, and a waiting. And, and in a sense in that, in that suspension and waiting, 
um, there's a kind of uh, messianism that's also perhaps implicit. So I was wondering whether, uh, what, you're, what, what do you think about this and how you think about this? Well, thank you, Andres. I mean, this is all a very complicated discussion, you know? Um, and I, I do, I, I will say that I think that, you know, and also in relation to what Richard was saying about the tradition, that I think that it's important to, to note, you know, I think it's not, the idea is not to leave the tradition behind, right? And say, well, we have to, we have never to read again, right? I think the important thing is perhaps to see where uh, certain principles of the tradition have, have reached a certain impasse, you know? Uh, principles that have been dominating and structuring, right, uh, as the, the, the epochs. And, and here is why the problem for me of political theology is complicated, even in the inversion of messianism, no? Because I think that messianism is constitutive, right, of a temporality of the philosophy of history, of the Christian Augustinian salvation of uh, community of salvation, right, of the deificatio in the Christian tradition. And the problem is, of course, the, the, the problem of political theology is, is at the end of the day, like Idris was mentioning implicitly in his intervention, is a question of, 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 of law and the juridical determination. That is why Schmidt always emphasized that he never spoke as a theologian, right? He always spoke as a jurist. And so, for instance, it's interesting, right, that theology, for instance, right, is, is still a play. It, it should be still a stake. Um, not to be confused with, uh, with political theology. And here I would, I would just mention that, for instance, uh, the work of one of our, our, our colleagues, right, comrades, uh, Martin B. York, the uh, Swedish uh, theologian, right, has a beautiful book about precisely this sort of uh, um, tradition of, let's say, uh, monstrous theology that is completely outside of the political, of the political theological machine. Right, the political theology the machine of 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 uh, economia of the person, right? Um, and, and I think that, for instance, that, that that should be very productive. Now, in order to be a little bit polemical, you know, uh, in in page one seventy four, you know, uh, Tari, and this connects to to some to, to a word to a, um, an important term that uh, Idris advanced, right? Uh, Tari says something interesting, you know, that I think should open a debate, you know. He says that he, he refers to the, the 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 Exodus or the stepping down of Benedict XVI. We know that uh, Tronti, Agamben are also interested in this gesture, right, of ex, ex ecclesia of leaving the church, leaving the great institution of the West. But then immediately afterward, he says, right, that it's not a mistake that the new Pope came from Argentina, right, and this is a paradigmatic force, you know. So I, I think you know I don't want to read too much into this. Right, but it seems to me that there is um, a, a little trace of political theology, right here, which which is tied, right. I think I don't I don't know what the status of the paradigm is here, right, but it's it's definitely connected to the situation in Argentina, right. And so, um, I, I Tronti is interested in in, for instance, the, the place of the church. And I think that, at least in my position, what I would suggest is that one should also move away from that. You know, we were recently having a discussion with the great David Kalei, you know, the Ivan Illich friend. And it's interesting that Ivan Illich, you know, who was a professional priest, right, at the end of his life, um, never expected anymore anything from political theology, you know. And even he called that the, the age of prophecy, you know was completed, you know, meaning the philosophy, the, the philosophy, the Christian philosophy of history was done, you know, even in the messianic force. And he proposed a sort of tenuous proto-category of friendship, you know, friendship as a way to uh, um, guide uh, the other, right, guide the other, but with no pretensions of, uh, let's say, a community of salvation. You know, that seems to me, uh, it is a sort of a transfigured theology, right, or something like that. Sorry for the for extending myself too much. I feel like if I if I can jump in, um, yeah. Uh, I feel like um, I realized I said very very little about any of the Italian context of the book in terms of uh, Tronti and his position to Toni Negri. Um, 
an operaísmo, autonomía and what he's doing there. But I think the 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 that he 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 does criticize Tronti in the book, um, which he has to do because um, I don't know. Is it very well known in the states? Tronti's incredibly contradictory current position. Does everyone know that? That Tronti is like a incredibly conservative left centrist senator and has been for 20 years and votes through all of the austerity measures and all of the worst laws this country has seen. Um, so it, it's difficult that he has to, you know, go to these things. And 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 you know, Marcello writes essays with Tronti. Um, so that he somehow has to deal with that contradiction. And I think he tries to resolve it in the same way that uh, Tronti himself does, which is just trying to kind of split apart his own self and just say, well, I have my body in the parliament and I have my mind in the revolution and somehow this is going to deal, uh, sort itself out. And I, I, the reason I bring that up is because Tronti is, has also been part of, um, for several years, part of a kind of tendency within the um, Partito Democratico of this extremely socially conservative uh, grouplet that is very close to the kind of the right-wing Catholics um, and so I think it's correct to have this kind of fear of political theology and of where it can push uh, even even people who have like an extraordinary revolutionary um, philosophy and and even past um, so I think that there's, there's a kind of practical warning there in the citations of of Tronti and and I fear about the where a lot of the kind of the followers of Agamben go with his uh, theologizing. And I think, um, I think Tari's book is very good at trying to, as, as, as uh, Tikkun and the, um, the Invisible Committee have been doing, to try and push a wedge um, into the, the, the Agamben movement and try and push some sides away from each other so that we don't just end up with uh, our comrades becoming Catholics. Thank you. That 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 is fascinating. Um, the 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 Italian piece. Um, so I wanted to take the next three questions kind of all together because they're all kind of getting at not the same thing, but I think um, uh, kind of practical matters. Uh, so the the third question is: In messianic times, we'll be playing with nothing quote. Uh, I agree the law should be destroyed, not played with, but are you arguing against play? Or can we play destructively and destituently? Um, so this is, this is one question. Um, and another is, um, Tari spends a lot of time on the notion of the destituent strike. How much of the destituent strike is a normative construction, um, an ideal as yet uh, to manifest, and how much of it is an empirical description? Um, and then the other practical question that we have is number five, the actual shape and acts of what count as destituent practices seem vague at times. Again, it gets back to the point raised here. Is it a protest? Is it a revolution? Is it a community garden? Um, what do you all see as real destituent practices and how are they activated and socialized? Okay. So practical matters at hand. What do you think? I'm not going to answer that. Someone else must. <laughs> I'll take a shot at the one about the actual shape of decision power. How about that one? Since the I think it's the most practical one, right? Um, uh, I, I think, um, or I'll, I think that the best way to get a handle on it is to kind of step away from the theorizing at first 
and to look and see how the term actually came about. And it came about through, you know, practical concrete events. So uh, the first place to begin is with Argentina in 2001, right? And, you know, the crescendo of knocking down one government after another in that December, right? That December, January uh, period, right? And um, secondly, I then think it's important to look at the next kind of instance of the use of justiciable power which comes from Mario Tronti's uh, like famous interview that still has yet to be translated into English, uh, which should be. Um, and uh, he steps it back a little further and he wants to say that he sees destituent power taking hold in, uh, in uh, the LA riots of 19, what is it, 91? Um, you know, he talks about Caracas and the counter coup. Uh, he even talks about Genoa in 2001 and he ends I think his main uh, example of destituent power in action is the Bonley Liu riots of 2006. And I believe the interview that he was giving took place in 2007. Um, now, it, to, to, uh, to kind of give it a little bit of substance, you know, he poses that he, even though he very much, Tronti very much supports these riots, um, he still thinks that, you know, it's actually a sign of weakness to some extent. And I, and I actually agree with him, you know, they're, they're kind of gasps of, uh, they're like, they're gasps of helpless, helplessness at some times, right? And he poses the question of justiciable power by arguing that, you know, all force is organized force, right? And this is how he leaves the question uh, of justiciable power. And he says, you know, on the one hand, these are kind of social movements, but, you know, to enact real true power, force and violence, that force has to be organized, but there's a paradox, you know, how can you have an organized movement? And I think that's the paradox that uh, he's been trying to work through. And um, I think Richard actually touched on that by, you know, uh, his choice to, to, uh, to enter back into the party, I believe in the early seventies, right? Was probably him seeing that, you know, he didn't want to be, he wanted to have some organization. He chose that over kind of the diffuse autonomy of the late seventies. Of course he was wrong there, right? But um, I still have a, a big soft spot for Tronti. Um, uh, I, it's not the, I, yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, it's not that, and I should also slide in that, uh, it's, not, it's not to become Catholics, right? The, the job is, it's, uh, as Agama would put it now, it's monks and delinquents, right? Uh, that's where I think we should be aiming, right? Um, I wanted to highlight in the, um, the second question, how much of the destituent strike is a normative construction and how much of it is an empirical description, um, and, uh, see if, uh, Andreas, uh, had, uh, a response to that, um, cause it seems like it, your, uh, presentation, um, was the one that bore pretty heavily on it. Um, you know, I think, um, I think we have the paradox here precisely <clears throat> kind of what Idris was talking about, which is, uh, you know, the, how, how to create a, or how to describe a kind of type, um, without be of, of the, of the, overthrowing of norms right that itself insofar as can be described can become normative right so um you know the way the way that i understand it and in this sense um you know my engagement uh with the notion of the constituent power is much more limited right um uh than than other panelists um but the way I see it, the way that I was trying to see it through um, the examples of, um, of both Sanctuary and the Caravan are ways to, um, they are a creative collective 
uh, encounters that nevertheless um, do not have the state and law as their horizon, right? So precisely, how do you think about a, uh, a kind of, um, a kind of political becoming or force um, of those whose very existence um, is, I mean, undocumented people exist because law exists, because citizenship exists, right? So in, in, in that sense, they already, you know, connecting it to the beginning of the book about the, the you know, the, um, uh, the proletariat, the, the ones who have nothing, right? Not just social position, but even the kind of qualities that will, uh, that, are, that are valued, right? So in, so in that sense, I think that the question of immigration really is uh, really important in thinking about a politics that does not um, reinscribe its political horizon in the uh, structures um, that are that are the condition of its existence in the first place, right? Like this. So, so how can we think of, of a politics of undocumented immigration? Without, um, without reifying the notion of the citizen, right? So, and since in my work, that's kind of what I try to do. Um, in so far as I think they're also when we talk about these concepts, they, a lot of these concepts, right? Uh, it's easy to to not to to homogenize them, right? So, I there's a beautiful there's a beautiful um, part in in Kristen Ross's. Um, book on, on the Paris Commune, um, where she precisely talks about, right, she's trying to trace um, a kind of prehistory or extend the history of the commune, right? So not just, uh, what is it, March 18th, right? And, 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 and the declaration of the commune and whatnot, right? She's trying to kind of go before and see what was happening previously. And she mentions <clears throat> this meeting in um, the previous fall or winter uh, where there's this kind of political meeting and um, the signifier of citizen comes back, right? Um, and and in, in a sense, she actually situates um, the uh, what would then be the advent of the commune. And in one of these, this is a, an important point, right? In, 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 in so far as, it's a return of a signifier, but that it's not um, one that's wholly inscribed within uh, the state and the law. Like what she says is, for example, I'll bring this up here. Um, she says, citizen in this instance does not connote membership in a national body, but rather a cleavage therein, right? So a social gap or division affirmed in the, in the heart <coughs> of national citizenry. So the word citizen, and no longer indicate national belonging, they are addressed to people who have separated themselves from national collectivity. So in some sense, <clears throat> you know, if we have this, this signifier of, of the citizen, which seems like the most uh, legalistic uh, kind of, of concept, um, it, it, has another, it has another history as well, right? And it has a history tied to, um, to the kind of interruption that I see resonate with Tari's notion of destitution, right? Which is you have a formation of the political and then you have an interruption from those whose very existence, right? Um, is a result of like through their, their, their kind of foundational exclusion, right? So the kind of constitutive notion of citizen as a national citizen, right? Tying uh, legal standing with the national identity as well. Um, is produced through that other counter figure, right? So when that figure forces uh, entrance, right, into political, forces a kind of taking of place in a place where they should not be, right, which is precisely the function of policing, right? Policing is taking matter out of place, right? It's putting matter back in its place, right? It's, um, it's surveying what is out of place. 
So, so in that sense, I think that even within the concepts, even within the concept of citizenship, for example, we have this other, um, this other form of, of politics that, that we can, um, um, that we can not restitute, right? But we can come back or that comes back during several times as well, right? And I think this is really important too, because one of the things I wanted to mention um, without going too long is the notion of, <coughs> of, um, of tradition and that he was, that Tari mentions um, or temporality, right? linked to it in 136 when he says, on the contrary, time can be subverted when one says, for example, that it is what is occurring now that renders a, a particular past possible, right? It becomes possible once more. This is why it always seems like a past revolution lives with any given new one, as if there were a kind of intertemporal communication between one another. The revolution today does not allow one to understand the revolu revolution of yesterday, but through freeing this from history's force field, allows, one's, it allows one to experience it as an ongoing task to bring it to its true transitory conclusion, right? So I think there's, there's a return, there's a temporality here, right? And, and kind of trying to think this along with, with, with Gerardo and, and, and the kind of exhaustion of certain um, political vocabulary, right? I think there's you know, that we need to see that that time is also, in a sense, you know, my question with regard, with regard to those arguments is that they also seem kind of linear, right? What, what we see is, is a kind of linear history now that we have an exhaustion of, of, this, uh, of these frameworks. At the same time, we need to recognize that, right? Well, we wait for something. At the same time, I think we need to recognize that and this is something interesting that, that Therese is pointing to here, that, that history itself um, also has, in a sense, these kinds of um, uh, potentialities that are, that are still continued to exist, right? Stunted histories, attempts at, at revolution that weren't, right? And that they continue to kind of pop back up, right? So in a sense, we can't just wait for the future, right? But, but the past returns, but the past does not just return as it was, right? And I think here, a beautiful example is, is Fanon on national culture. Fanon you know, for him, national culture is, uh, is not a return to origins, right? He's very critical about that. For, for Fanon, tradition is always underneath the surface, but changing, it has been changing the whole time. And when it reemerges, it doesn't reemerge as it was, right? So in that sense, that kind of temporality of a return, I think that, um, you know, that there, there's these attempts even within the very con concepts that we use that have uh, that work against um, it, it's more kind of manifest histories, right? So I think even the question of citizenship, right? That, that we can think, or that there's a tradition of a kind of destituent gesture of, of citizenship as well in, in precisely affirming um, an existence against uh, the legality and authority of the law and the state. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and uh, so in thinking about time, I think like time and linear time um, goes into this, uh, this next question. Um, someone uh, put in the YouTube chat uh, asking uh, for the panel to respond to a quote from uh, an, an, a recent EndNotes essay called Onward Barbarians. Um, and the quote references destitution, uh, specifically it says, um, but against those who fetishize destitution as a positive or revolutionary way forward, we would emphasize that today every power is becoming destituent. Um, and so do any of you have a response? I think specifically, Gerardo, do you have a response? <laughs> Well, I, I, it's a great essay. Um, I, I recommend everyone to, to read it. Um, it's an important piece. And I, I, think, I think more or less that's the point. It's the same, it's more or less, I tend to read it as, um, as the problem of, of anarchy, right? When, when Benjamin says, or Pasolini says that power is anarchical, right? 
or when uh, Josep Rafael Iorra says that uh, the world is becoming fragmented. Um, I think the, the important thing is to be able to um, to liberate in a way, right? To liberate the, uh, the 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 procedures and the technification and, and administration of of that process of destitution towards a free play of forms, you know, uh, at the level of singularization. Uh, even 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 critical of of any communitarian closure. And and I think that here I, I will. I will say one more thing, which I think is um, also the, the, the book opens to, uh, which is the question of institution. I think that uh, I think that is um, that is not uh, the problem of representation or the problem of governance is not reducible to the problem of, of institution. And I think that uh, in the for, for some reason I think that this is a, this is a future debate. You know, the debate between community or commune. Right uh, and and the question of institution. If we understand institution as a as an anthrop as an anthropological form, right, of being able to liberate uh, the time of life, right, against the burden of proof, right, and th then it's very interesting because, for instance, ne uh, neoliberalism or or the technification of today's finance economy or the metropolis is an anti-institutional um, procedure. The same thing in law, right. Uh, the, the, the crisis of positivism, right, in, in juridical thought is the rise of, uh, of the decline of institu institutionalization. And that's why, in a way, uh, as Bruce Ackerman, right, the great uh, constitutionalist of the we the people, of constituent power in the United States, says the, 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 the epoch uh, of social movements as being able to conquer rights is also, uh, is also in crisis, right, or also exhausted. But I found it interesting, and I'll finish with this, that Agamben closes um, the book on the, the last installment of Homo Sacer, of uh, the use of the body, with, I think, with, with what is a sort of uh, secret demand for institutionality, right? Because when he talks about the uh, no, nocturnal council, right, in Plato, it seems to me that that's the question of how to give con continuation to the destituent gesture, no? as a problem that is not necessarily uh, enframed in the question of just interruption of messianism, for instance, right? So um, I would say that, yeah. Idris, do you have a response? You look like you want to say something. Nah, <laughs> that, was, that was great. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Um, and we're, we're at about time. And I think that that's a really lovely place to end it. Um, so thank you so much uh, to each of our panelists. Thank you again to Common Notions and Resume. Um, and uh, the uh, book launch events for, um, there is, no Unhappy Revolution um, are in the chat, uh, the YouTube chat. Um, so if you, yeah, exactly. Richard just said a provocative place to end. I agree. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so thank you everyone. And um, hopefully people will make it out to the book launch events. Uh, thank you, Bella, for moderating and Idris, Gerardo, uh, Richard and Andres for your contributions. And speaking about contributions to Red May, you can go to our website, www.redmayseattle.org and donate either through our Fan the Flames of Red May or as a patron through Patreon. And uh, what do you get from that? Well, uh, even just for this Red May, we've got plenty of Red May left. Uh, Today we have uh, Marx, Asia, and History coming up at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, with a sad hater and a bunch of stellar contributors. We have uh, tomorrow, we have Critical Theory in the 21st Century at 11, uh, Counterinsurgency Policing at 5. We have Dead After Graver at 11 on Friday. What just happened at 3 p.m. on Friday? Uh, we do settler colonialism at 10 a.m. 
on Saturday, neither settler nor native, quite germane to this moment in the Middle East. And we also do the Feminist International, How to Change Everything at 5 p.m. God, I mean, what more can you ask for? Run to that website and give. But anyway, thank you for coming and listening to the discussion and I uh, hope to see you this evening. Okay.